This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Home ownership is a goal for many Americans, but housing costs can keep that dream out of reach. Coming up, we learn how the city of Baltimore has taken a different approach to helping its residents buy homes in neighborhoods that have long been neglected. Baltimore's chief operating officer for its housing department will join us to talk about its Vacants to Value program. That's later. Now, cities and towns don't like abandoned buildings and overgrown lots impacting the nature of their neighborhoods or impacting property values. These areas are often described as blight. We'll get some context on the term and hear how municipalities have battled the problem, which often affects poor communities. Laura Bliss from City Lab will join us with that. First, we wanted to hear what's happening in Connecticut's Brass City. Waterbury has a rich manufacturing past, but like many northeastern cities, when industry left, so did much of the population. And in areas once bustling with activity, there are now vacant homes and buildings. So what's Waterbury doing to address these abandoned areas? Joining me in studio now is Dan Pache, Community Development Planner for the city of Waterbury. Dan, welcome to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Now, I had mentioned uh, your role as the community development planner. You're also a native of Waterbury. So tell us what, uh, in your role, how you've been addressing the issue of blight in in the city of Waterbury. Sure. So in about 2017, uh, the city, uh, along with the Harold Webster Smith Foundation through Webster Bank, worked together, kind of a public-private partnership to figure out, um, you know, what we do as a comprehensive approach uh, to tackling blight. We have had, you know, in the past um, and currently uh, a blight task force that works on these issues. But recognizing that citywide we have, um, you know, dozens of properties, hundreds of properties that are blighted, what do we do moving forward with these properties? Um, and so a study was commissioned. Um, and through that study, the, uh, one, of the f- uh, one of the recommendations coming out was essentially uh, we need a plan for what we have already in blighted and vacant uh, properties and what we should be doing moving forward to try to convey them, get them into the hands of either developers or homeowners um, that can get these properties back online and back to productive use. When you mentioned blighted properties, describe some of them for us. How many do you have in in the city? Yep. So when you talk about blight um, kind of overall, blight is is really a type of of disease when you think about it. uh, It starts to manifest in certain areas. It can spread if you have it in small doses. Um, and so when you have that disease in your community, uh, you want to figure out how you can contain it. Um, and then when you have it, you want to eliminate it as well. So blight in, in Waterbury, um, as you mentioned, we're a post-industrial city, just like many cities uh, and towns in Connecticut. Um, particularly around uh, and down the Naugatuck Valley, we have towns where um, we have these three-family houses that were built up around the brass factories. Um, we had so many people at one point uh, in the city that we, you know, we built these multiplex family uh, houses where you have maybe six units in one. Um, And as industry declined, uh, you started to see uh, the people leave. And so we didn't have the need for these large three family houses anymore. Um, So they started to get into decline. Um, With that, you start to see boarded up windows. You start to see overgrown lawns. Um, When you get those overgrown lawns, the disease spreads and you have dumping in these lots. Um, so you can get properties that are, um, you know, may have had a fire five years ago that hasn't been addressed, you know, they still have the fire damage, boarded up windows, overgrown grass, and it starts to become an accumulation, um, which is one of our biggest blight issues in the city and in, our, in some of our poorer neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have an issue. We're trying to address that issue. Um, And we're trying to contain it where it is and trying to be uh, proactive in what we do moving forward. I understand since you've come on board, uh, you're working on a database to really track where these parcels of land are. We're talking about 15,000 parcels so far today? Yeah. So uh, one of the biggest recommendations from the study was essentially, um, you know, they had come in, we were all in committees, um, and they asked these separate groups, well, how many blighted properties would you estimate that you have in the city? And we would give you know, numbers off the top of our heads. And we have dedicated staff that have been working on this in the city for decades. Um, But we couldn't give an exact number. Uh, So the Center for Community Progress came to us uh, in the final report and said, look, you may want to look at getting an exact number and a final report and kind of saying, this is how many properties we consider blighted. So we're working um, in the city. We have about 32,000 parcels that we're dealing with um, citywide. 
So what we're doing um, right now is we're going through each and every parcel. So my house is going to be evaluated. Um, you know, everybody who lives in the city, their house will be evaluated. Um, so we're going through this process of, you know, good, fair, and poor. Uh, so far, we're about halfway through. So we've been doing it since February. We have about 15,000 parcels completed already, and we're working toward that 32,000 parcel mark. Um, so I'm proud that's one of the things that we're, we're working on. We should be getting it done in the next few months. And then when we get that, we'll have an assessment of kind of where we are exactly on, you know, what our housing stock is, where the blighted properties are, how many we have of them. And we can kind of get a total um, mass of, you know, exactly what we have so that we, then we can start working on um, str strategies to remediate it. Uh, when we talk about uh, vacant or abandoned properties, overgrown lots, uh, some of those properties are essentially abandoned yep. and no one is taking responsibility for them. But how does the city of Waterbury uh, uh, communicate and work with property owners who may be of a fixed income mm -hmm. or they um, have a condition where they're not able to take care of their home like they once did? Sure. Um, so I'm just curious how you work with property owners uh, so that there isn't just the um, rush to seize a property and sure. then try to remediate it with another owner. Well, that's an excellent point. And so uh, what we do as a city, um, we have a very comprehensive approach to how we handle blight. Um, so we have a community, we have a very, very strong in Waterbury community um, engagement uh, and community outreach uh, section of our police department. Um, and so when we're dealing with blighted properties, um, we can assess on a case-by-case -case basis what's happening on each property. So our blight officers and our blight crew can identify which properties we know um, that are, you know, just owned by property owners who are not here or somebody who's been in this house for 40 years Maybe they can't maintain it uh, to the level that we'd like them to maintain it. Um, but there's different varying levels of, um, you know, what we look at when we find blighted property. So if we have somebody who's been there for 40 years, we may approach that differently than somebody who, you know, has bought it through tax auction three years ago, hasn't done one ounce of work on it, um, and maybe he's sitting on it to, to wait for um, rent values to increase in the neighborhood. So... Uh, we can really take a look at it and we can have discretion and see, you know, uh, we know our neighbors. I know, you know, and, and our blight guys know, we know who lives where um, and we can um, definitely have discretion on what we um, what we can enforce. You mentioned that uh, within the police department, there is a, a blight, uh, uh, I guess, task force, yes. so to speak, uh, that officers that are working on this particular issue. Um, and does that help with community relations or can it can it also can it hamper that depending on how resident views the police? Yeah. So I, I think that, um, again, in, in Waterbury, our community relations has been extremely strong um, for years. We have the Police Athletic League which is a massive organization in the city. Um, it's really grown over the last few years. Um, and, and so it's just really taken off. Our current police chief has taken a, a very large approach in, in the youth development in the city. Uh, and so our community relations um, officers are the ones that are dealing with the blighted properties. They're the ones that are in the neighborhoods. Uh, they're the ones that go to the community groups. Um, and so uh, I, uh, as well, since February, since taking on this role, have gone to different neighborhood groups and we're just conveying to them and to our residents that we want a better quality of life for them. Um, and so that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, we want to make sure that if somebody's living next to a, a vacant property where their the lawn may be up to their knees, we want to make sure that that is remediated for them so that they can go outside in the summer and not have to deal with rodents or any other issues. Um, so we're making it clear that we're not trying to be punitive. We're just trying to make sure that you know our codes are enforced and that we have a better quality of life for all of our neighbors. This is where we live in studio with me, Dan Pache, Community Development Planner for the City of Waterbury, Connecticut. We're learning how his city uh, and later others are dealing with vacant and abandoned properties. There's different remedies, and depending on where you live, those remedies uh, are different for each municipality. Uh, what's interesting uh, about this conversation uh, was a coincidence, but the idea that there's actually two bills before the General Assembly that went through, uh, one was signed into law by Governor Lamont, the other one waiting for a city and it relates to how municipalities uh, handle uh, blight in their communities. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that now with uh, Laura Settlemeyer, who is Director of Blight Remediation for the City of Hartford and a chairperson of the Hartford Land Bank. Laura, welcome to our show. 
Hi, Lucy. Thank you for having me. So can you tell us more about uh, these two particular bills and why they were needed? Sure. So the one bill that you mentioned uh, that has now uh, been signed into law, uh, now Public Act uh, 19-92, an act concerning uh, abandoned and blighted stewardship is based uh, heavily off of the Pennsylvania uh, blight, uh, uh, Blighted and Abandoned uh, uh, Conservatorship Act. Um, and the, the term that we're using here in Connecticut is actually receiver and receivership. So a lot of different terms here, but the concept is generally the same, which is how can we, uh, the community, get access faster to these properties to begin rehabilitation work. Um, In Connecticut, especially, we have quite a lengthy foreclosure process. So if we're talking about um, a bank doing a foreclosure or a municipality performing um, a blight lien foreclosure or tax lien foreclosure, it can be quite a lengthy process to uh, get to the end of that process. And all you have with respect to these abandoned vacant properties is a different owner. There's there's no work that's been done yet. It's still vacant, abandoned, and in fact, in further deterioration because no work has been done. So the objective of that bill, again, now law, uh, is to be able to get access to the property so we can start the rehab work faster, and especially to empower our community development corporations, our local neighborhood groups, uh, to be able to um, to uh, to 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 take advantage of um, to to give them a tool to be able to uh, take control of these properties that are really impacting the quality of life in their neighborhoods. So, Laura, explain a little bit more. So, with this uh, bill now law uh, for a receivership, who can uh, go to court to petition for authority to seize a vacant building or area that, with the hopes of then rehabilitating it? Sure. So. Uh, a, a couple of different parties um, can can be uh, can file the action in court for to, to petition the court to appoint a receiver, and in the party that files the action doesn't necessarily have to be the party that's appointed the receiver, although that is typically, I think, what you see in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and uh, other cities like Chicago and Baltimore. Uh, so the um, someone who can file an action would be a potentially an owner of the property if there are multiple owners and they're looking to clean the title there to the property. Um, a municipality could file an action. But the key feature in our law in Connecticut is that uh, a, a resident or a business or a nonprofit developer group that's operating in in the neighborhood can petition the court and be appointed the receiver to take care of the property and stabilize the property. Uh, certainly, uh, this sounds like a good remedy for municipalities to deal with, say, out-of-state landlords that have really abandoned areas and uh, refuse to uh, keep them up to code and can cause uh, health and uh, crime issues. But when you think about, uh, you know, the other cities and modeling uh, this law, uh, I'm looking at uh, the Pennsylvania conservatorship law that you mentioned. Uh, Currently, there's a federal lawsuit uh, based on that law in Pennsylvania where uh, property owners say that um, they feel like they don't have enough due process or notice uh, to fix up their, their property before the government can come in and take it away from them. So how does the Connecticut law address those concerns, Laura? So, Lucy, thank you for bringing that up. That is a very important concern to uh, to, to those of us work, working in this space and, cer- and certainly uh, to those of us in, in, in Hartford. And so what we have done with the law is that there's um, – there are a couple of opportunities in which the the property owner uh, gets gets noticed. So, um, and one of the changes actually that we made to the Connecticut law that's different than the Pennsylvania law is that any owner of a property has to be named as a party in the action, as opposed to Pennsylvania, where they are given notice of the action and have the option to intervene, which uh, I'm not familiar with the case that you mentioned, but could could possibly be the source of some frustration with owners. If uh, they didn't intervene initially, they, they might not be getting uh, notice of future actions in that case. Whereas in Connecticut, they would actually be named a party in the action, so they would get notice, not simply at the beginning when the action is filed, but also at every step along uh, along the way. I'll also say, you know, our objective with a tool like receivership, and it's similar to the new anti-blight ordinance, anti-blight and property maintenance ordinance that uh, we passed in Hartford two years ago. Our objective really is to 
uh, be able to identify those property owners who do want to step up and do the right thing. And when that happens, to get out of their way as quickly as possible so as not to frustrate their purposes and, in fact, be able to connect them to the resources they need so that they can uh, retain ownership of the property and maintain it and and be able to continue uh, continue doing so. And my hope is that the same would, would happen with receivership here, too, that if the um, and there is that opportunity. Now, that is similar to Pennsylvania, that there's the opportunity for the owner to, to step forward and say, no, I, 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 I would like to do the right thing here. I, I would like to, a chance to rehab the property. And then we can stop the receivership and allow the owner to get to work so that not only is there um, – enough due process and notice to the owners, but there's also an opportunity for them to do the work themselves and for um, you know the government and the courts to get out of the way and allow them to do so. I wanted to transition back to my in-studio guest, uh, Dan Pache, again, community development planner for the city of Waterbury. Uh, Waterbury's mayor, uh, O'Leary, as well as Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin, uh, both uh, supported the stewardship bill that Laura just mentioned, but also a land bank bill. Uh, this is something that your office has been working on, uh, Specifically, Dan, what is that and how, do, how would that work? Yep. So uh, right now in the city of Waterbury, uh, if we have property that we own, um, whether we took that through uh, tax foreclosure um, or it was a property that had, uh, had a fire years ago and we had ownership of, of the lot, um, right now if we want to dispose of that property, if we want to get into the hands of a, uh, maybe a fair housing development agency or nonprofit development agency, uh, we'd have to go through our um, formal process as adopted by our Board of Aldermen. Uh, and so when you go through that process, it does get our properties through. So it can get them into the hands of a developer or an interested neighbor who wants to take care of an adjoining lot. Um, but they have to go through uh, the process of our legal process to get it from the city. Um, so it can get confusing for some of these neighbors who just want to take a, a side property that they, you know, they've been dealing with for years that's been, you know, overgrown. And now they want to take it and add it to their tax bill and and at minimal cost to them. So we have done that. So we've gone through the RFP request for proposals process, um, and we've gotten property out of the city's hands, into the neighbor's hands, so that they can take care of property. What a land bank would do would be to make it easier um, for this entire process to happen. Uh, So now we would have um, kind of less um, confusing documents in front of people, so they wouldn't have to necessarily look at, you know, um, legal documents that maybe they won't know how to complete um, and have to go through our entire purchasing uh, process. A land bank would streamline the process essentially. And now that we would take, say you had to take a property and put it into a land bank, uh, we can then have one pot of money to market that property, to show the property, uh, to hold on to it. And then once we're ready, convey it to a, another organization that can take it, um, either put a clean, safe, affordable housing in, in some of these neighborhoods uh, or maintain a lot in the case of a neighbor. When we think about uh, how a uh, city or town uh, makes a decision of who then gets the property to, re- to redevelop, is the intent with the land bank as well is that you're looking at community organizations that yes. are vested in the city of Waterbury? Correct. Yep. So um, in my title in community development, um, that's essentially what it is, Lucy, is we're trying to make sure that our development in these neighborhoods is community-based. And so that is why, you know, we've We've been going to these neighborhood associations. That's why when we get to a point in a property, when we're ready to sell a property from our inventory, from the city, we look at who we want to sit on a selection committee to select uh, the next owner of the the lot. We'll bring in a community leader. Uh, So they're sitting at the table with the city officials, and they have a say on, you know, well, I know uh, that on this property we've had vice issues in in the future. So whoever takes this property uh, should be somebody who, you know, uh, has two family housing uh, in mind because we have you know a need for housing in this neighborhood, but we may want to see a parking variance. We may want to see them provide parking so that we don't have on street parking. That is input from the community that you know maybe we don't necessarily know because we're not living on that street every day. So we bring community members to the table as part of these selection committees to figure out who the next owner is of these properties. Uh, Laura Settlemeyer is with us on the phone, again, Director of Blight Remediation for the City of Hartford and chairs the Hartford Land Bank. How's it been working so far in Hartford, Laura? (laughs) 
Thanks for asking, Lucy. So we uh, we set up uh, our land bank uh, almost two years ago now in 2017. Um, as a result, we were very fortunate to uh, get a grant from the State Department of Housing uh, back in 2016 to uh, seed a land bank for the city of Hartford. And we are working with other partners um, like the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving uh, to to build upon uh, that grant and to, to create a land bank here in Hartford that we hope will be active um, later this summer and fall. Um, and, and similar to what Dan is saying in, in Waterbury, the, the idea is to provide a, a specialized tool or resource for both the city and the community. And I have to emphasize here that um, I, I always say that, you know, a, a land bank really cannot work effectively unless there is genuine, robust community engagement, that, it, that the land bank is very much a tool for the community, working with the community as much as it is a tool for the munis- municipality itself. And the idea is to uh, come up with strategies for these properties where truly no one is stepping up to the plate to take responsibility that effectively the market has rejected and to get control of the properties and to figure out what is the precise issue that is causing uh, no one to step up to the plate. Is it environmental concerns? Is it um, title issues? Are there just so many liens on the properties that you just can't make sense of who owns what and who has first priority? Um, or is there, you know, a partially collapsed uh, structure on the property that needs to come down before construction can begin? And the idea is for the land bank to isolate those issues and perform that work that's necessary to uh, to generate a pipeline of properties for um, local neighborhood developers to come in and and pick up the properties and and take it to completion, whether that's developing um, uh, quality affordable housing or uh, whatever is in line with the community objectives and and priorities. Mm. And you expect uh, Governor Lamont to sign this bill into law, Laura? Yes, we do. Yes. Well, we appreciate you uh, explaining to us uh, exactly uh, what these uh, uh, two uh, specific legislation that passed through the General Assembly this session, uh, what they will uh, do for municipalities. But I want to thank Laura Settlemeyer again, Director of Blight Remediation for the City of Hartford, for joining us uh, today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lucy. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Dan Pache is in studio with me, community development planner for the city of Waterbury. Uh, Coming up, we're going to continue talking about how uh, communities handle vacant and abandoned buildings, often uh, described as blight. And we're going to learn more about the context of blight that's been used through the years as communities uh, consider redevelopment. I just wanted to read a tweet from Aaliyah. Uh, She wrote, thrilled to hear today's show on Waterbury, a.k.a. the dirty water, a.k.a my hometown. There's been a status quo of no interest to not address blight in certain neighborhoods. Uh, That's their problem attitude. Uh, Glad to hear about changes and outreach to the community. Uh, This is where we live. We'll be back right after a short break. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've been hearing how cities like Waterbury, Connecticut, and Hartford have been addressing vacant and abandoned properties, uh, often described as blight. In studio with me, Dan Pache, Community Development Planner for the city of Waterbury. Now, the term blight is used widely, even by the president. I will also propose tax holidays for inner city investment, a new tax incentive to get foreign companies to relocate in blighted American neighborhoods, and they will do that. It will be worthwhile. It's called incentive. They will do it. That's from a Bloomberg politics video of Mr. Trump speaking back in 2016 about his New Deal for Black America. Now, we wanted to know more about how blight has been used by communities over the years to justify redevelopment in certain areas. Uh, For that context, joining us via Skype is Laura Bliss, West Coast Bureau Chief for City Lab. Uh, Laura, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I heard um, my earlier guest, uh, Dan, uh, describe a blight as disease in a neighborhood. That's essentially where the word comes from. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, this is a term that um, urban reformers and, and local leaders um, have been using uh, to refer to uh, the kind of condition of neighborhoods and cities since the 19th century. Um, and gardeners are probably pretty familiar with the term too, because um, that's where it comes from, right? It's actually a term that was originally used to refer to disease um, in crops and in plants. 
Um, and it really started being used in the sort of urban context at a time when uh, kind of early social scientists were looking around at cities and trying to understand uh, the kind of growing um, social problems that they were observing, uh, you know, coinciding with population growth and industry and dense housing and trying to kind of understand it through scientific terms. And so they came up with this term, they sort of transferred this term from the agricultural and kind of gardening word blight to describe um, this kind of growing uh, menace, as they put it, um, and similar to just kind of how, how some of the other folks on the show described it, right? This this thing that creeps from something like, you know, a broken window or a deteriorated house to, um, you know, more trash in the street or um, other kinds of damaged property. And even um, we've, we've kind of seen it linked to to crime and other kinds of um, unwanted behavior in, in urban spaces. Uh, when people hear the term uh, blight, they often think about uh, when a city or a town moves in uh, to either raise uh, that property uh, and to bring in a different development, that that then leads to gentrification. Yeah, and I would point out too that, I mean, even before we get to gentrification, right, blight, that term, so kind of going going back, turning the dial back on history a little bit, um, right, we see it starting being used in the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, indeed, as kind of a, a pretext for explaining why or for, for sort of um, winning over arguments, right, about why certain neighborhoods should be redeveloped. And and um, it's uh, definitely became an important term um, in the kind of urban renewal programs, of the 1950s and 60s, where we had federal gr- uh, federal grants um going to cities that were, in some cases, experiencing um, population decline and, and in others not, um, to actually um, displace um, what were often um, immigrant neighborhoods and, and neighborhoods of color and uh, to to raise their properties, right, and, and to create um, new stuff in their place. I think Hartford is actually um, an example of this, as is New York and Chicago and Philadelphia mm-hmm. and Pittsburgh and, and many, many, many other major American cities. I'm actually from the Pittsburgh area, and a, a really good example of, of a, a city using a blight designation to uproot thousands was uh, the gutting of the historic Hill District. This was a predominantly African-American uh, community uh, that uh, there were lots of uh, jazz and culture. Uh, everyone knows August Wilson uh, grew up there, uh, wrote fences, and uh, the city of Pittsburgh uh, uprooted uh, thousands of African-Americans and actually led to the decline line of that particular neighborhood that the city of Pittsburgh is still trying to figure out how to redevelop today, Laura. Yeah, that's right. I mean, right, we, we're kind of experiencing this this second wave of, of downtown regeneration. And in many ways, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not just Pittsburgh, but other cities, too, sort of grappling with the effects of, of having replaced, um, you know, what were one at one point densely packed neighborhoods with, you know, office parks and and um, and hospitals, which and, and, and you know, um, like community um, centers of other kinds, which are which are great, but but take up large swaths of land and and don't have the same kind of um, concentration of, of people <laughs> and kind of life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it it is to say that you know the the term has been used to mean a lot of different things over the last hundred plus years, and and that there is because it is so closely tied with these. Um, processes of of urban transformation that are closely tied with um, immigrant neighborhoods and um, African American neighborhoods and, and and later on Latino neighborhoods that um, it can be a loaded term too um, it, when it's when it's used a little bit too loosely it, it, I think it has at times um, been been fraught with those kind of uh, racial implications as well uh, because uh, because of what you just mentioned Laura some urban planners have called for uh, uh, cities and others to not even use the term blight to come up with an alternative term has that gone anywhere um, yeah, that's right. There was a, an urban planner, Justin Garrett Moore, who's, who's prominent in the New York City area, who who kind of proclaimed in a, in a 2015 essay that that we need that new word. Um, and and it and his point is is largely kind of what we were just discussing, right? That it is on the one hand, you know, this incredibly um, ubiquitous term that that city planners everywhere use to to describe real things, right, and real problems in their their cities, right? Deteriorating properties and 
um, and uh, things that really need to be addressed to um, intervene with declining property values um, and you know even the health right of of local residents. But on the other hand, it's kind of fraught with all these loaded terms and and um, and it and it can be sometimes so vague to the point of not even being incredibly useful, right? So he does kind of call for for a separate term. Um, and no, <laughs> I don't think that effort has really gone anywhere because it is such a ubiquitous term at this point. Mm. Um, but but I think I think the, the sort of interesting point about his essay and and um, this argument, which is not just his, but but has definitely come from others as well. Um, is that, you know, where possible, um, kind of using the term as specifically as possible and, and to use it to describe properties, right, or, or actual space rather than um, kind of broadly and amorphously to, dis- to possibly describe entire neighborhoods full of people um, is key. Laura Bliss is joining us via Skype. She's a West Coast Bureau Chief for City Lab today as we talk more about a uh, blight and uh, what it means, the context behind the term and how uh, cities and towns across America have used uh, uh, that term uh, as a reason to redevelop uh, particular uh, parts of communities. In studio with me is Dan Pache, Community Development Planner for the City of Waterbury. Uh, Dan, how do you uh, work with community members um, who may be concerned about about uh, displacement or gentrification in certain neighborhoods of Waterbury. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a very fair point. And, and even in the 1960s when we were building our highways, we split them through our cities and we split them through, you know, neighborhoods that were generally uh, poor and uh, immigrant based. Um, so there's that fair and there's that's a justifiable fair. Um, I also think uh, when you bring up the term community engagement, a lot of times that's meant, you know, that you maybe you maybe have hold one meeting at city hall for the residents to check mark you know stipulation as part of a, a study that you have to require community engagement and i think that's the wrong way to approach it um what we've done in waterbury is tried to go directly to the neighborhoods um instead of holding a hearing for them you know where we present our plan and then go away um we want to be active in their neighborhoods so we want to go to their community centers we want to hear you know what their issues are day to day, um, what they think their needs are. Again, I, I mentioned parking. Um, that's been an issue in Waterbury where uh, maybe in the winter months when you're parking on the street, the streets get so narrow uh, that it's hard to pass through. So one of the uh, comments that we get from neighbors uh, in different neighborhoods in Waterbury is if you're going to bring in a, you know, a multifamily housing unit, uh, we want to see a plan of parking development. Um, and so... They let us know what they want to see in the neighborhood so that we're not coming in with a firm fist and saying, here's what you're going to have, and this is what you're going to deal with. Um, We want to make sure that they have the loudest voice in the process um, because they're the ones that live there day to day. Um, And I I agree 100 percent, and I think that whenever you go in to a neighborhood and you kind of dictate what uh, the issue, the resolution of an issue should be, I think that's the wrong way to approach it. I think you should hear from them on what the resolution should be, and I think you should work alongside them to achieve that goal. Um, and so, you know, what we like to see is, is a, for, a safe, affordable housing in these neighborhoods. Um, you know, we're not necessarily looking for a developer in some of our inner city neighborhoods to come in and put market rate or high price apartments uh, in these neighborhoods. We want to see it in line with what the income is. Um, now that I mentioned earlier in the broadcast that we had three family houses that because of the decline of industry, we lost population. We're starting to see that population grow again in Waterbury. Our schools are bursting at the seams. Um, And a lot of those uh, are renters. So uh, they may not be buying homes, but they're living in apartments. Um, So we're starting to see a swell back into our city and specifically our inner cities for people who are getting pushed out of different areas. Maybe they're getting pushed out of the Bronx because uh, their rents are getting higher in the Bronx. Or, you know, they're getting put, maybe they're getting pushed out in New Haven and they're moving up to Waterbury and they're using our school systems. And so we're starting to see a housing need again. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we're trying to be as responsive as possible to what they want to see in their neighborhoods and what they want as, you know, their quality of life 
uh, continues to improve. Uh, describe the demographics that you're talking about, uh, people that are moving in back into uh, Waterbury's downtown. I understand uh, Post University uh, has a, a place at the table there with attracting people into the city of Waterbury. But if you're talking about people in their 20s, young people, cities want young people to come back. Right. You know, do they want to be living in a, an apartment in a three-family home? Are they right. looking for, you know, some more uh, hip housing, so to speak? Right. So, um Right now in, in downtown specifically, we are starting to see um, an influx, again, of employees into our downtown, which uh, to us is, is tremendous because for years, um, you know, the building that Post University, just to give a, a little bit of a background to that, uh, that was a former department store, um, which had been closed since 1997. So, Lucy, I was five years old when it closed, um, and it sat vacant since then. Um, and last December, we've had an influx of 400 employees that are working there now. Uh, they're working in admissions. They're working in um, call centers. Post University has a major online presence in um, online learning. Uh, and now those people are going out to lunch. They're going um, to dinner. Uh, it used to be for years in downtown Waterbury. At 501, it would the sidewalks would be empty and be a long line to Route 8 or 84 so they could get back home to their, you know, suburban houses. We're starting to see a difference in that now. At 5.30, you start to see people out at bars. Um, you start to see m more market rate apartments in more mixed use um, development in downtown. So now a lot of people are living in our downtowns. Um, and for many years, it's it, we, we're not displacing anybody because the top floors of a lot of these properties were storage and former office space. So we're seeing conversion into apartments in downtown, which is very interesting because for many years, Waterbury didn't have this mixed use component. Um, so now you're starting to see life again on a Saturday. So, uh, which I had never seen before. So it's it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, before we head to break, uh, Dan, I did want to ask you, um, you know, where is city of uh, the city of Waterbury looking, uh, uh, whether it's in the Northeast or other places around the country, as a model for what you're hoping to achieve? Sure. So at the end of July, a team of us from Waterbury are going to go visit Newburgh, New York, because they have a land bank actually set up. Uh, New York had the legislation set. Um, so we're going to go take a tour of Newburgh. We're going to see what they're doing well um, on the land bank legislation that they had there uh, to see how it's working in practicality. And we can uh, see what we take back with us um, back to Waterbury so that we're successful successful from day one. Um, a lot of times uh, because we have cities uh, that are similar to us and the Northeast is, is filled with cities like Waterbury, we can see what has been done right and what's been done wrong, maybe more importantly, um, so that moving forward we can uh, make adjustments and make it work for us. Well, Dan, we appreciate you coming uh, up to Hartford to explain uh, what's happening in the city of Waterbury. Again, Dan is Community Development Planner for uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, Dan, thanks again. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, this is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to learn about another uh, model uh, for communities. This is the city of Baltimore that has a unique program that goes beyond just raising abandoned buildings. And Laura Bliss from City Lab will stay with us as well. And you can join the conversation, too, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Home ownership is a goal for many Americans, but housing costs can keep that dream out of reach. Now, the city of Water, or rather, the city of Baltimore, has taken a different approach to helping its residents buy homes in neighborhoods that have seen neglect. Uh, Baltimore's chief operating officer for its Department of Housing is joining us now to talk about a unique program. It's called Vacants to Value. Uh, Jay Green, welcome to our show. Uh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I should also mention Laura Bliss, who's a writer for City Lab. She's the West Coast Bureau Chief, is with us as well uh, via Skype. Uh, Jay, so tell us about you know how Baltimore um, has dealt with blighted properties. Well, I, our vacant to value has been a cornerstone uh, program for us, um, but and recently we've begun to build off of that program and kind of um, expand how we do and how we approach community development. Um, you know, basically, our Vacants to Value, a V2V program, it's a way to try to get city-owned properties in the hands of uh, developers, small developers, and um, people who are interested in, um, you know, purchasing property for 
home ownership or even uh, revitalizing the property for rental as quickly as possible in some of our um, in a more distressed uh, neighborhoods. So, uh, so if, if you have abandoned properties, uh, the city of Baltimore, you use receivership to access those properties and then you're able to then sell them uh, at a, a good discount to residents? Yes, uh, receivership is an additional kind of tool that we have. It's a primary, primarily a code enforcement tool where um, we issue uh, citations to property owners who are neglecting their properties. And if they don't respond, uh, we take legal action uh, and put it into our receivership program. Uh, the receivership program, we have a not-for-profit receiver um, who then auction off the property uh, and to a different owner who's interested in rehabbing that property. Mm. And we've been very successful with that program, and it's, a, it's one of the largest receivership programs in the country. And combined with our Bacon's the Value program, um, we seen in a success in, in revitalizing some of our more difficult neighborhoods. Uh, we heard from uh, a woman who works for the city of Hartford uh, talking about um, a law uh, that uh, Connecticut has uh, just signed into law, a law, actually a bill uh, that essentially um, helps uh, municipalities uh, gain um, or have the authority to seize a certain property uh, for redevelopment. And she mentioned that it wasn't just about um, you know switching hands because you don't want to then uh, give it to someone who will then let it uh, remain uh, blighted for for years and years, and so there's a, a timing mechanism for the the value uh, vacant to values program, where if somebody does um, purchase this property, they have to do something with it in a certain amount of time. Yeah, I, for the vacant to value, we actually um, make them fill out an application, and and we vet the we vet the uh, the applicant, you know, in terms of their resources and their plans. Um, so. We try to do this all within, you know, like make sure that it's back on the market within a 12-month period. So we do a lot of vetting beforehand, of kind of like I said, in terms of what the plans of the developers, what the plans are, and what their resources are to accomplish that plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, Jay Green is Chief Operating Operations Officer, rather, for the City of Baltimore's Department of Housing and Community Development. We're learning about a unique program uh, there uh, that will that deals with uh, blight and also uh, redevelopment. You know, it, it, the va- Vacants to Value program launched in 2010. How has the city changed, Jay? Well, we've seen some success in a number of our neighborhoods, and we have recently uh, come out with a new era of neighborhood investment, and it's a framework for our future community development. And um, what we're trying to do now is to build on uh, the strengths of our neighborhoods where the Vacants the Value and other programs have been successful in revitalizing uh, some of our neighborhoods and, and continue to build on, on that strength um, that's been created um, through revitalization and the programs like V2V and and our receivership program. And then how do you address uh, concerns about gentrification, Jay? Well, part of our process um, is is very community-based. You know, we get community buy-in with uh, our plans and how we approach community development. Um, It's our citizens definitely are concerned of, about uh, displacement, and so part of our policies uh, include equity, we about equity and inclusion of existing residents and what we call legacy residents, residents who've lived in these neighborhoods for a long time. So we try to develop policies that, that keep them in place. Um, we have home ownership uh, programs, we have renovation renovation programs that uh, help them to stay in place. So but we deal with these issues through uh, largely through com- community engagement. Mm. 
Uh, Laura Bliss is with us via Skype. She's the West Coast Bureau Chief for City Lab. Uh, Laura, you've been hearing a little bit about uh, Baltimore's uh, Vacants to Value program. Uh, other cities like Detroit have also uh, come up with different ways of uh, dealing with neglected neighborhoods, bringing people back, uh, giving them the opportunity to purchase homes. What can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Detroit is kind of a, a um, the poster child. Um, they've, in addition to having a, a, a pretty um, substantial abandoned property uh, problem, um, they've also been pretty innovative over, over the last um, five years or so in, in how they're dealing with that. And and that includes like crowdsourcing efforts to get um, residents involved in reporting um, abandonment um, and, and blighted houses as well through a uh, bla- what they call a blexting service, a blight texting service, um, and that's kind of adding into to a database that's that's um, transparent and and available online. Um, and through the collection of that data, it sounds like Hartford is engaged in a similar process, right? That lets the city kind of figure out, um, you know, where the properties are, and and then kind of engage um, in a strategic process of figuring out, you know, what to do with them. Um, and that's something we've also seen repeated um, in Chicago, right? I mean, it's another city that's been offering offering up empty lots for for as little as a single dollar, um, and and up from there um, on auction. Um, other cities that uh, have other other kinds of innovative programs um, are Philadelphia. Um, this is actually a city that's had for decades um, a, a, a strong partnership with a local horticultural group. So. Going back to that history of uh, blight as a uh, gardening <laughs> term, it's kind of interesting. But so they're they're gardening society, right? These are volunteers um, have a, have for decades been involved in in kind of taking over abandoned lots and setting up community gardens on them. And um, and they've actually because that program is so longstanding, they've actually been able to do research um, on some of the uh, positive impacts of that. Um, and just a little bit of greening they found have have been able to has been able to increase property values and. Um, curb gun crime to some extent. Um, Jacksonville, Florida has an ordinance similar, I think, to what Connecticut is talking about, or Hartford rather, um, allowing the city to demolish abandoned homes. Um, I reported a story about a year ago in Columbus, Ohio, where uh, a local hospital is actually working closely with the city to um, renovate abandoned and deteriorating housing um, as a sort of community health intervention, right? Because there's sort of a growing body of research that shows um, how important kind of neighborhood surroundings are to um, different kinds of health factors. Um, So, yeah, I mean, every city really has, although many cities were affected by the same kind of macro trends that we're talking about, about depopulation, um, you know, throughout the 20th century, and in some cases, this um, urban renewal um, trend that we also saw in the middle of the 20th century um, that cities are trying to grapple with. Um, each city is different, right? And 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 so-called so-called blight looks different in in each place. And so I think uh, each city has its own kind of strategy too. Uh, we should note we've been focusing a lot on uh, how municipalities turn over blight into uh, housing, I mean, oftentimes affordable housing or new housing, but uh, cities and towns are using uh, old spaces for new ideas. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, parks, there's uh, pop-up markets, farmer's markets, uh, uh, as well as turning out viaducts and rail lines into urban gardens. We don't have to look further than uh, Manhattan's uh, High Line uh, for, for that uh, being a success. Uh, but it has been an interesting conversation conversation to learn about these different uh, models uh, of uh, cities and towns tackling blight in their communities. I want to thank Laura Bliss, who's the West Coast Bureau Chief for City Lab. She joined us today via Skype. Laura, thanks so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Also with us, Jay Green, Chief Operations Officer for the City of Baltimore's Department of Housing and Community Development, telling us more about the Vacants to Value program in Baltimore. Uh, Jay, thank you. Thank you. Today's show produced by senior producer Lydia Brown. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. And on the phones today is WMPR intern Jesse Steinmetz. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>